To have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200 inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. Sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Going to sit down, record a solo podcast, and we'll get right into it. I just want to thank a couple sponsors. I want to thank Cryptech. I have the best technical mountaineering gear system put together for all different seasons that I've ever had. Uh, so impressed with their early season gear, Sonoran pants, Sonoran hoodie. Uh, so impressed with their mid-season hunting elk. Uh, just a, a, a great pant, great sweatshirt, vest combo, uh, great jackets, and they have different offerings for their rain jackets for their lightweight all the way to a heavier weight, super durable, like for the Alaskan bush. Uh, everything for late season. Uh, love using their puffy pants, puffy jacket. Uh, just a great piece of gear to keep me warm on the vantage point, round camp, or when I'm sitting still. So uh, I also really enjoy their camo pattern. I think it's one of the best ones out west. So that obscure transitional is what I've been using, and it just blends in so good in every habitat that I hunt. I'm so impressed by it. Uh, they also have their altitude, which blends in really good in timber and dark spaces, and I find even hunting the high country that I blend in really good in the trees and in the shadows with it. So it's a good camo pattern as well. If you're in the market for any new camo, make sure to check them out over at Cryptech. Uh, they got a brand new website, really well organized, uh, easy to search items and search for different seasons or different hunts. So make sure to check that out over at Cryptech.com. I also want to thank Matthews. Uh, Matthews, is, they're building such great bows nowadays. So I uh, have that new phase four this year, and I've loved you know, the last five years of Matthews. But this phase four is so forgiving and shoots so well. Uh, it, it's shooting great groups for me, and then it's so quiet. And uh, quiet bow really helps me out for hunting the different species like mule deer and axis and, and antelope that'll jump a string. Just quiets down that bow noise when it goes off. So, so impressed how they've uh, implemented the, the rubber design and the limbs and it really makes a big difference in sound. Uh, such a forgiving bow, holds its tune, stands up to all the abuse I throw at it in a season of bow hunting all over the place, and uh, couldn't be more pumped with how this Phase 4 is um, tuned up and shooting. So, going to get its first test here in Australia. I'm super pumped. So make sure to check them out, or at least go shoot these bows and see which one fits you best, but go check them out at Matthews. They're just building great stuff. I also want to thank Black Ovis. Black Ovis is a internet retail shop. We have a promo code there, Elevated10. You can save 10%, but they have all the top name brands as well as their own name brand. Absolutely everything for your Western hunts. A real knowledgeable staff. If you're in the market for anything for your next hunt, make sure to go check them out over at Black Ovis. I also want to thank CamoFire. CamoFire is a, an app where they have 80 new hunting deals that come up every 24 hours. A lot of these are top name brands and just overstock items or items where they um, uh, want to get rid of them and move them. And so they give them at a huge discount to you. If you watch the app, you can see some of these deals come up. I know my buddy Dan and Dylan use this app and are constantly finding good deals on it. So check them out over at Camo Fire. Over at Eastman's, we have that Mule Deer course running. We do have a promo code to save 10%. And I think it's like... $99 for the mule deer course and take you about a week or two to go through over a hundred videos uh, that breaks down everything I know about mule deer hunting. So the promo code Brian MDC. Uh, I think it's just such a, a huge benefit and asset to mule deer hunters out there to learn to hunt the West in different units. And you can apply a lot of these strategies to hunting different species as well. So check that out at our mule deer course. And, um, Check out Eastman's Tag Hub. Promo code there is Brian, and you can get a free Mountain Tough subscription for a year, which is a huge benefit. I really like those guys and the program they're putting on, and I've been trying to do more and more of these style of workouts mixed in with my running and uh, really helping with overall strength. So uh, you get that for free just by getting uh, Eastman's Tag Hub. Promo code Brian. 
uh, check out um, our Beyond the Grid. Uh, we've got a really good film coming up, or I hope it's a good film. I haven't seen any cuts yet, but I know I captured all the footage, uh, Life of a Bow Hunter. So I'm so excited to see what these editors come up with, and um, hopefully they can tell a good story. So I uh, should have the first draft here soon. But you can look out for that on uh, Eastman's Beyond the Grid. That's our internet TV show on YouTube. And uh, I have uh, a half dozen or so episodes on there now and new ones releasing all the time. Uh, also, Dan Picard does an amazing job. His hunts are incredible. He's got a couple of his big bulls that he shot this year that will be coming up. So you can check that out at uh, Eastman's Beyond the Grid. And with that, let's get into this podcast. Man, oh, man. Um, springtime. It's been a while since I sat down and did a podcast. I think the last uh, solo podcast anyways. I think the last time I sat down, I was just finishing my house. It was about half out of my mind. <laughs> but I did have some uh, clear thoughts, and man, it was um, such a beautiful thing to finish this house for me and my family, get us moved into it. And so uh, it's kind of got back to normal life where I'm able to to manage everything, manage family and uh, manage Barney Construction, still trying to wrap up a few of these jobs. And then, um, uh, yeah, and then and, and really want to go um, full time, you know, working on the podcast and hunting industry and, um, you know, some of my personal investments and things. So that still is the plan, just um, trying to get these jobs wrapped up and um, uh, set up Barney Construction for success in the future. So uh, working away on that, but just able to manage everything better. Uh, I was just under such a heavy stress load. So it's nice to get back to myself, get back to training full time. Uh, Just had some great runs, uh, great uh, like um, uh, mountain tough style workouts that I've been doing here. Got the garage all organized and shaped up. I mean, it's not perfect yet, but it's uh, pretty close to perfect for me. This house is just designed so well for me with this office recording studio it's got a bathroom out here separate from the house and then have the archery range and the uh, big garage you know where I can store my stuff it's just been awesome so yeah worked hard got that phase four set up and shooting been shooting a lot of outdoor just getting ready for this um, big Australia trip but um, yeah just able to manage things uh, a little bit better with um, time on my side so yeah it's uh, been getting back to normal here and um yeah, we're just cruising on jobs and getting things done and then just enjoying life. Like I say, training and shooting my bow, uh, fishing adventures. And this isn't a, a fishing podcast, but man, it's just um, living an adventurous life is so fun. Like spending time with my family and my friends and laughing and really trying to soak up this life. I've been working hard to just like live in the present moment, like not be stressed over the future or things that are going on or things that I have to deal with. Like I... Uh, don't procrastinate, get things done and do the best I can and make decisions, but also like just enjoying these moments, enjoying, you know, dinner at night with my family or joking around or laughing or enjoying like these days out fly fishing, like I've had a bunch of adventures. And for me, I have like such a love for the mountains and such a love for the rivers. Like I, I just love fishing these rivers, like give me a fly rod and a river or the mountains in my bow and I'm a happy man. But, um, some of these adventures I've had fly fishing have been crazy cool where I just, um, you know, I'm out for an adventure in extreme weather and, um, never quite sure what the river's going to throw at you as it changes year to year. And, um, you know, just big wades across the river, big adventure. And then like just catching, you know, hunting for these, um, giant trout that are, you know, that go, 24 inches and bigger and just fight so hard and like test every skill set you know from a lifelong love of fly fishing you know so it's been super fun I just find such correlations between hunting and everything really and so I find a bunch of correlations when I'm fishing and hunting for big trout and I'm so present in that moment and um you know really looking for them and different runs of water and reading it and you know of course there's Fishing pressure, not much here winter and spring, but, um, you know, fishing pressure and then um, trying to figure out what nature's doing and dialing it in. And when you get one of those big ones to eat and he's acrobatic and taking line and fighting him and then you land him with a buddy in that elation, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's dang near like shooting a mule deer with a bow, you know, catching one of those great big world class trout like that and then to share it with some of my buddies and some of the laughs I've had. Um, so I just been really soaking that up and enjoying life and just getting back to like my more, my normal state of mind, which has been really good. 
and I'm so excited for bow hunting action here, man. It's like, uh, you know, I plan this trip as kind of like, um, a reward for like putting all these long hours and building this house, spending everything I've ever made, you know, trying to build this thing. And so, uh, I have these two really good buddies in Australia, Josh and Craig, they were out elk hunting with me last year and they invited me to go to Australia. And, um, man, I mean, um, just such great guys like they're just bending over backwards to make sure that I'm all lined up for this trip I mean you know picking me up from the airport places to stay places to hunt vehicle I mean they um I know they're taking time away from their families and their jobs to to help me experience this so it just means the world to me and um so excited to get over there I mean to have the chance to go like like, I love mule deer and elk are some of the coolest things to hunt. I mean, and antelope and bear and everything that I hunt with bow, like, I fall in love with axis deer. <laughs> like, uh, So, I, I guess um, it's just so fun when I get to hunt a new species, a new challenge, a new habitat with my bow. And Australia is such worlds away from the lower 48 here. And um, to be able to go over there and go experience, you know, red deer in the rut. And I, I seriously, I say this, I really don't need to arrow anything. Like, I'm just um, so excited for the adventure. Um, just being um, being out there and being able to be present, being able to hunt red deer and hear them roar and see them. They're such a different species. And I did get the chance to hunt red deer one time in New Zealand. Um, hiked up this, this public drainage and free range red deer, like, like, um, the red deer that you see that go 500 inches or that have points going everywhere. Uh, every one of those is in a high fence, like, um, real free range red deer, like the ones in, um, you know, they have them in, uh, New Zealand and Australia and, um, down South. And this is one of the things that like, um, it's tough because I see those red deer and I just know that everyone was in a high fence or grown and in a safari park, you know, except for these wild ones. And the wild ones, they just, they look a little bit different. And so they look like a five point bull elk and then they'll have crown points. And I saw, like I hiked up this drainage in New Zealand, a punt up there. And you talk about a special trip. It's already been like a few years since I've been to New Zealand. Dude, it changed my life over there. Like it is wild over there uh, to be able to hunt um, tar up in the Southern Alps and to be able to hunt fallow deer. And, and I had some good buddies that really helped me out down there. Uh, I was able to team up with my Hawaii buddies and then um, went with Remy that knows that place like the back of his hand and, and really shared a bunch of his knowledge out there. And uh, but to hunt those fallow and they, they live in like similar ter terrain as mule deer, like open sagebrush country. And then we just timed the croak perfect and just got the best fallow hunting on planet earth. It was so good. I lost my mind out there. Like I left the truck, no food, no water, like just a morning hunt. And I was gone all day long till dark. I think I ended up arrowing one that day. It was just incredible hunting. I mean, um, the palmation on those things and the excitement and then the, the tar was so cool in the Southern Alps, just the, the gnarliest terrain up there and, you know, all public ground and used to just like it, it looked like, it looked like Lord of the Rings, you know, it's so pretty that above timberline Southern Alps and those tar, such a cool species. But my point is, is that getting to experience these new species and new places is um so exciting and thrilling for me like i like moose last year was um new for me able to harvest my first moose like i i love taking on these challenges of new species and um i did get to hunt red deer a day in new zealand we didn't dedicate a lot of time to it um but there's some public drainages that you can go up and huts that you can stay in and so um got a tip again from Remy you know he told us like hey this drainage holds some red deer and there's some tar up high and you guys should hike up there and we just had one free day and so we drove our rental van up there it was like one of the only places we could get our rental van and we drove up there and hiked in and we kind of split up and I went way up the drainage up there I actually ran into a couple uh, New Zealanders that were hunting with a rifle up there and they were packing out a giant stag, like a free range. I think he was like a seven by seven. So like a five point shape, but crown points, but one of the biggest free range stag that I've ever seen. The thing was amazing and they were packing it out and they had super short shorts on and the bugs were bad that day. They had to get their legs just eaten alive, but super uh, short shorts and gaiters and just 
those New Zealand guys, man, they can walk and they can hunt, you know, and these guys had put in the effort and had killed a giant stag and they were just stoked and they were packing it out. So got to visit with them. I even got a couple photos, which um, I should put some of those on my Instagram. They're like great photos of those guys. In fact, I think I will. But I ran into those guys and then um, got to hike up this drainage. And this drainage, it's got this world-famous fam- trout river. Again, my love for trout fishing. But just this teal, blue, glacial-fed uh, stream. And then it's kind of open in the valley bottom. And I'm able to glass the sides, but then just giant mountains on either side of me. And uh, I'm hiking up there. I see those guys. I keep hiking up. I don't know what I did that day, maybe five, six, seven miles up this drainage. But I get up there, and all of a sudden I look up the drainage, and I can see a red deer, a stag, and a good one. And he's crossing the open drainage and going to come cross the river. So I, like, literally started running the edge of the timber and using the undulation and topography. And I'm trying to cut him off where he's going to come across. I was so close to cutting him off. I was like, I don't know, maybe 150 yards, 200 yards from where he crossed, but I got pinned down where I was then in the open and kind of ran out of topography or the the red deer had gone across and um, had like got a new perspective on me after he crossed the river, so I couldn't move anymore, and then he went up in the timber. And he roared up in the timber. Oh, God, I can't even do it. I'm horrible. But uh, I've been listening to some videos, and then uh, Craig sent me a video of this red deer spot of them roaring. So cool, man. But he roared like a couple times in the timber, and I was chasing him like an elk in there. And they had, like, ferns. Um, And I come from the Pacific Northwest is where I was born and raised. So these ferns, like you know, are all over the place in the Pacific Northwest. And they're real similar. They're just like a touch different. Just Southern Hemisphere on an island. It's just like this different fern that I've never seen that's got this different leaf structure. And same thing with like the sagebrush or same thing with all the plants. They're just a touch different, which is wild. And then just getting around, driving on the wrong side of the road down there, like trying to keep that straight, just keep left, keep left, keep left. It's so weird driving on the other side of the road. And uh, just the whole experience so far from home and trying to figure it out. And um, man, it's just like this incredible trip. That's why I'm looking forward to Australia. And Craig, um, buddy Craig is really good at hunting these red deer. And he's killed some good stags and he's got some good places to hunt. And he stalked one for like two hours the other day. That was just a beast of a red stag he sent me a video of. So, man, I'm just getting all pumped up for this adventure. And um you know, it's like uh, we have to, to do all these things in like a, you know, we have to make a living and we're providers. And um, so, you know, that's a big portion of our life. And we also have to chase our passion, you know, and, and this bow hunting is definitely my passion and, and adventure is my passion. I just want to live as much of it as I can or more of it. You know, it's like so this will this will be absolutely amazing. I mean, definitely going to be tough to be gone for two weeks with everything I have going on, but just have to get all the work I can done. Uh, trust that my my wife, my family will be taken care of. They'll take care of things. Uh, my business will be taken care of, and uh, just go let loose and live in the present moment and soak up this adventure. So yeah, uh, Red Deer is going to be an absolute riot. I'll have more than a day to chase them, so really be able to dial in. And it's the closest relative to an elk, and they call, so I'm just so stoked to hunt them. And then I fell in love with, um, I fell in love uh, with hunting these fallow deer, like just the palmation and point structure. And then they have like the same size racks as mule deer, same body size. They come in all different coats from like axis coat to real light colored to, to dark colored, almost black. So they have all these different colorations and then they have so much palmation on their horns and so many points, just like this beautiful species. And they, they rut a bit different. They make these rut pads and then they croak. And then they they attract the the hinds or whatever to their rut pad, the stags do, and then um, they they rut in these rut pads. But man, I just had such a riot hunting these things, and to be able to go back and do it again is going to be amazing. And it's going to be during the croak again, and so um, super stoked to chase those around. And then some new species that I have never hunted. You know, I definitely have never 
harvested a red deer and only have that one experience of that one drainage up there chasing that thing around in the timber and eventually he lost me stopped calling couldn't catch up to him in the timber not sure where he went but um so really stoked to like focus in on those and get a chance to possibly harvest one and then um they also have sambar down there, and sambar are known as one of the tougher species to kill, or the toughest species to kill down there. And, um, yeah, my, my buddy Josh is really good at hunting them. And um, they don't call, but they are going to be rutting. You use a lot of tracking skill, hunt a lot of uh, thicker country. I'm hoping there's kind of some semi-open terrain that I can glass. Uh, but I have, like, this great mentor in Josh that is a really skilled hunter and has harvested a bunch of those things with his bow. And also Craig has a bunch of experience hunting them. But um, it, it, they are kind of live down where Josh lives. So, um, yeah, it's where I'm flying in first. He's like man, we can go hunt them the evening you land. <laughs> I'm like, oh, sign me up for that. But these sandbar are extremely difficult, and they have these killer dark coats and um, this dark horn structure and um, really challenging. And so, like, I'm just pumped to embark on the challenge and, like, spend time with these guys and, like, um, really just soak it in, be in the present moment, this totally opposite side of planet earth and you know just being this average carpenter i never thought i'd be able to travel the world or travel to new zealand or australia like um just keep working hard uh keep working hard and get myself into a good position and then able to do these things um at an affordable cost you know due to like having really good buddies down there that are going to host me and go out of their way to show me a really good time so um so stoked on it man i just can't wait so, um, yeah, I fly out next Saturday, going to take care of some stuff, go out there. They also have um, the, the Russian pigs or Russian boars. Those guys really enjoy hunting them out there. Um, it's one of those guys' favorite out there is hunting those things. And so I've been watching videos and checking out those things as well. And usually when another bow hunter loves to hunt a species, like I equally will fall in love with hunting those things. So I've never hunted them before. Uh, so that'll be super fun. Really looking forward to maybe chasing some of those things around and then, um, yeah, just, just soaking it in just adventure. Like it's just so different than any place I've been. I mean, you're talking saltwater crocs and, uh, uh, brown snakes and spiders. Like there's a lot of danger down there too. Uh, but it's just, it's so world's different. I've never stepped foot on Australian soil. So hopefully I have all my paperwork in order and they'll, will let me in to go do some bow hunting action hopefully my bow will show up down there you know that goes like traveling you just have to kind of go with the flow like it'll be a long 18 hour flight and I've got to fly into uh, the way my flight goes I got to fly into LA and then um, fly into uh, New Zealand and then from New Zealand into Australia so it'll be a lot of flight time it's just like get my mind right and going to do really cool things and then um, get on the travel and uh, get over there and go have some fun but yeah just um like a like a true adventure so i'm so fortunate just to have the opportunity to be able to do something like this and uh so i'm just going to make the most of it and really enjoy it so i'm gonna go do that and then come back and then um spring bear will be opened up super stoked about spring bear um i was on quite a run of arrowing really good mature bears and i think Spot and stock spring bears are one of the toughest species in Montana and in really, you know, in the lower 48, like they're a real challenge in Montana, Idaho. They're really tough to kill with a bow, especially a mature boar. There's just less bears than ungulates than deer and elk. Like the one good thing is their numbers are condensed in the springtime. And so uh, due to where the snow level is and the snow melt and then due to where the, the freshest, newest, greenest grass grows right at the snow melt, and they call it the green wave, or I've heard it referred to as that. And the green wave is as the grass greens up, it starts low on the mountain and just keeps working its way up through the springtime, and those bears will follow that green wave and follow that good food source. So when I'm hunting bears, you know, I had quite a run of arrowing really good mature boars. Gosh, I had it going, and then... Last year, you know, I started hunting early in the season and then started my house uh, right in that same time frame. So, you know, I got some days hunting bears and I wanted to make sure that I didn't give up my entire hunting season, but I just didn't get the time that I normally get. And so last year, wasn't able to able uh, arrow a bear. 
And I also had planned a trip like it was kind of late when it turned on and I ended up missing like the best week of the season, like that first week in June as I, I went on that that trip to Hawaii to hang out with those guys and hunt there. So I did miss like a really good part of the season last year, but also due to doing my house and I mean, not that there's any excuses, but uh, last year I wasn't able to mat- arrow a mature bear, and so it almost gives me renewed vigor for this season. Like, I love the different color phases. I love a mature boar. And just like I was telling you guys, like, I fall in love with every species I get to hunt. And uh, when I first moved to Montana, I hunted bear with a rifle, and I shot one with a buddy, and it wasn't, you know, it... um no, rifle hunting for bears is super fun and super challenging as well, looking for a big one, but it just didn't hook me for some reason. And um, I got into hunting, and I just didn't take part in the spring season much and just kind of focused on deer and elk. And um, then eventually, like, I don't know, a few years into being out here, I was like, man, I'd really like to kill a black bear with my bow. And I took on this challenge, and I just fell in love with it. And so now it's been 15, 20 years at every season, really looking forward to the spring and chasing these things around. But um, elevation is key in the springtime. Where you find one bear, you're going to find more. And I would say, you know, for where I'm at in southwest Montana, you know, I also hunt some places, um, some other ranges around me, and I'll hunt western Montana. Also, northern Montana can be really good. Uh, I've also hunted Idaho. So, you know, there's some good spots around, but... It, it tends to be like the start of the season, April 15th to May 1st. I'm kind of finding these bears definitely at lower elevations. Like the elevations I'm going to find them are going to be 5,000, 4,500 to 5,500, 4,500 to 6,000, fairly low in elevation. And I'm just finding them coming out of their dens. So I'm looking in real rocky, rough country and uh, very sparse meadows and things, but real rocky, rough country where I think they den at. And these bears will come outside their den and they'll wander around and then go back in their den. And they run this program for like a week or two where they're just getting outside of their den. Uh, They're feeding around, but you can still get a snowstorm, rain. You can still get nasty weather. And so they stay like pretty close to their dens, it seems like. And then as it comes into the mid-season, which is my favorite season, is like that May 1st to May 25th to May 30th, where these bears are coming out and they're really keying into the green grass. So they're moving from their den location and they're trying to find the greenest, best feed they can. And and bears really like seclusion in the mountains. And so... You know, instead of like here in southwest Montana, if I look at a wide open south slope, I very rarely see bears on it. Sometimes I'll see them crossing or sometimes there's enough timber and uh, it lays out where the bears like it. But they really like like these pocket parks on these north side facers. So see a timber and then just a pocket park in that sea of timber. And on that north side, it gets more shade, less sunlight. So it grows like this deep, dark green color. And uh, the bears also have seclusion. And when you're glassing for bears, really glass for them in the edge habitat. They're going to be in the edge of these meadows, not in the middle of these parks, most likely. And um, so I really focus like on the grass. And the other thing about this this early season is the timber hasn't greened up yet. So as it gets later in the season, the timber will green up and bears can just work their way through the timber feeding away. Well, in this early season, this meadow grass greens up first. And so they're like forced to be in these openings or on the edge of these openings where you can glass them. And also when I find a bear, he's usually not on the move. Like if you find him during the rut or in the late season, you know, sometimes you see him and they're like, you don't even have a chance at them. They're just rolling country, just looking for a sow or moving habitat. And they're really tough to catch up to. But in this, this mid season, this May 1st to May 25th, they're really keyed into the feed and they're like more patternable. They're going to come out in the edge of this meadow, feed for an hour or two. They're going to go back in the timber. They're going to bed down for an hour or two. They're going to come back out in this meadow. And so this allows me to uh, like like close the distance on them. So if I see a shooter bear, um, you very rarely see bears close to you. Like sometimes I'll run into them still hunting or 
I love still hunting down skitter roads or I'll still hunt to my different vantage points and I'm looking for sign and I'm looking for bears as I'm hunting to them and sometimes I'll pick out bears doing that. The majority of times I'm sitting on a master vantage or I'm running a mobile vantage point where I'm working a ridge line and glassing all the open features as they expose to me. But um, I hardly ever spot bears close. Usually when I see them, they're miles off. They're so far away. They're just like this monumental go. And it's part of the fun thing about bear hunting is like you're always, you see this bear this long ways off and you got an hour and a half left to light. And it's like, well, man, I um, got to give myself a chance. I got to go for it. But I'm always pushing the boundaries of how far I want to go in a certain amount of time and then have to hike back in the dark for, you know, till midnight to get back to the truck. But it's part of the fun of bear hunting is like it forces you to push your limits and, and to really go all in to try to kill one of these bears. And they're they're few and far between like man i can go a day in a really good bear spot working all the best vantages and not see a bear and come back to there there the next day and i'll see three like they can be just be random and and um you know there's days where i don't see bears usually by the end of the season i end up averaging a bear a day for being out but you know one day I see five and then for four days I don't see one or, you know, end up seeing one, two a day. It's like, um, you know, it can be tough. Um, but yeah, hardly ever see them close. They're always usually this monumental go, which makes it fun. But during this mid season, when I see a bear come out, like what I'm, what I'm weighing on is how long will it take me to get to that bear and how long do I think that bear will be out feeding? So, you know, and that just comes from time of watching and observing bears and, and uh, reading their man, you know, are they moving or are they just feeding? Did they just come out in this open park? Is it the start of the afternoon, evening feed where they're going to be out for a couple hours? Like just trying to answer these questions and then how long will it take me to get to them? And if I can get to them in time, if I have a consistent win, then I go. And if I can't, uh, and it's a shooter bear, you know, I may come back the next day. But usually what I want to do is capitalize on this sighting that I have, and so I'm going to close the distance. It's like, okay, how close can I get where I can then see that bear, keep a good wind, and then when he comes out in that park, then make a play at him. And also, like, I love to make a play. You know, wind is everything with bears. They smell seven times what a bloodhound does, uh, 2,100 times what a human does. So, like, uh, uh, you fart in the woods, a bear smells it. <laughs> like, they, uh, their sense of smell is so strong. And if you spook a bear, um, a lot of times it's the wind. The wind just swirls or they just get a whiff. And what this does is it makes me better at reading mountain winds. It also makes me better at hunting the wind for these bears because it has to be right. So, in turn, that makes me better at hunting elk, you know, like, the more scenarios have been busted by wind than anything else and so when i'm hunting elk in the mountains like this all these these days experience of hunting bears and getting my wind right and reading winds in the mountains make me way better on getting in on elk and reading the wind there or for mule deer whatever the case is i always say like hunting these different species in different habitats improves different skill sets which in turn makes you a better hunter and uh bears will definitely make you better at reading winds so, um, I, I'm trying to analyze when I see a bear, if I want to go for it, um, you know, how long will it take me to get there? Will the bear, bear be there? And so sometimes I'm just staging up closer to that bear. And, um, another thing is, well, let's, let's finish out the seasons and behavior. So, you know, we went through the mid season on the grass and as it starts to get into the later season, the timber starts to green up, and so these bears don't have to be on, on these open parks as much. They can kind of wander through the timber or sparsely open timber and feed. So I'm still using master vantage points. Um, the thing that, things that go in your favor are is um, the uh, bears are rutting this time of year, so the boars are starting to cruise country and look for sows, so it's good and bad. The boars are moving more country, so they're more visible as they're rolling through country. But they're also on the move, so sometimes they can be tough to catch up to. But once they get a sow and they're trying to breed her, they're really uh, chasing around that sow. And I've killed a handful of bears on sows. In fact, the last big cinnamon that I kill is big six-foot-plus bear. Um, he was chasing a sow. I thought it was his cub at first. He was so much bigger than that sow. Uh, but that uh, that sow, I mean, he was... 
double the size, if not triple the size of it. So I had to look close, but it was a jet black sow and then a giant cinnamon boar. And he was chasing her around in a meadow, feeding with her, just hanging out with her. And so when they get on these sows, they're really going to stick close to him and they'll stay in one spot a lot of times. Sometimes they'll chase him around and move within an area or, you know, they can, every scenario is different. But this boar was with this sow in this meadow in this park. So cool is where I chased a big chocolate like a handful of years ago. And uh, so able to kill one in this drainage, put a perfect arrow into him. And the, the sows will kind of hang around after you shoot the boars. And that's that's in another thing. Like um, hunting black bears, it's so thrilling. Like for us, it's a blue-collar dangerous game hunt. It's like, you know, I never say never, and maybe I'll be able to hunt grizzly bears or brown bears or something. But hunting dangerous game like requires uh, this focus and... And the decisions you make directly affect your safety, and they're just different than ungulates. And you have to be really good on your shot, and you have to have nerves of steel to be able to hold it together and place a perfect arrow through a bear, and especially when your life's on the line. Like, they're different than ungulates. You hit a bear with an arrow, it's different than a deer and elk. It's going to roar, and it's going to bite at the arrow, and it's going to escape and and attack anything in its way. And I've been charged by a couple of them that I put arrows in. Like, it can get sketchy quick. So, you know, it's like us blue collar guys, like this is our chance to hunt dangerous game with our bow. That's how I see it every year. It's like I may never be able to hunt grizzly bears or brown bears, but I can hunt black bears every year and they have different color phases and then, you know, weigh up to 300 pounds. And you think of an NFL linebacker that can run 20 miles an hour and, and, and hit you and weighs 250 pounds. Bears weigh more than them. And they can run 30 to 35 miles an hour, and they hit you with teeth and claws. Like, there, it is, I say entry level dangerous game a lot. It is not entry level when you're hunting them. You know, if that thing decides to attack, there's no entry about it. So it's like this excitement and this thrill of having to really be on your game, having to hunt a, being able to hunt a, a, a predator out there. Like, um, but it's, you know, we have to be ready for these situations. Like part of our responsibility is to make sure that we come home to our family. So we get this thrill and rush and truly feel alive, like being able to hunt these things with with true consequences to our actions. And and so it just forces me to make sure that I'm prepared. It forces me to make sure that I that I keep myself together in these high stress moments. And there is no better feeling than this thrilling encounter and being on the edge of danger and making all the right moves, all the right stocks, and putting a perfectly placed arrow into a mature 300-pound boar. Watch him roar and spin and bite at that arrow and expire within 100 yards. Like, you can do that on a bear. You can do that on any animal. Any animal in North America, any animal in the world, you know, it's like... It, it really tests your mettle of being able to hold yourself together. But you need to make sure that you're prefer- prepared for these scenarios. So, I mean, bear spray is great. Like, I like having bear spray on me in case I run into a bear that I don't want to shoot. Um, and for years, I trusted my life to bear spray, backpacking around these wildernesses with grizzly bears. And so, you know, like, that is my lifeline and my safety, and it's a lot lighter than a pistol. Uh, nowadays, like, I've had a couple charge me, and so... I made a hard rule that I will carry my pistol whenever I'm hunting bears. I'll take the extra weight to make sure that I can keep myself safe and protect myself. And so hunting these bears, like, um, you know, it's sketchy trying to keep the wind right and closing in and moving in. And where it really gets sketchy is when you hit them with an arrow. Um, you know, I've been charged by a couple and not that they're looking to come charge or kill me, but like the, the one that charged me, I hit with a good arrow that I hit back in the liver and he disappeared behind these limbs uh, straight down below me. I shot him at like 50 yards, disappeared behind these limbs. I couldn't see him and I knocked another arrow. And like 20, 30 seconds went by, and then I catch this bear on the other side of the limbs, and he's like running up towards me. And he's just like running on a death run to go die. He doesn't know I'm there, doesn't know what he was hit by. But as he's running up, I make the mistake. So I just get in the habit is when I'm hunting deer, I baw at him to stop him, you know, stop him for the shot. Or if I'm hunting elk, I cow call at him and to stop him. And that bull stop. Well, bears, I huff at him. Like, if I'm trying to get a shot, I try to act like another bear, huff at him, he'll freeze, I'll get a shot. So this is, like, wired into my brain. So 
as this bear is running up towards me, I huff at him. And I, I huff, and when I huff, he keys into my location, pins his ears back, and comes straight at me. And I could barely get my bow back and loose an arrow. And I always thought I'd shoot a charging bear in the chest. They have their head down, and they're so low to the ground that I shot them behind the head in, like, uh... The, the like on the side of the spine right there and the arrow pinned down went through him caught both lungs and turned him and died 10 yards away from me just like oh my god and so after that scenario I started carrying my pistol and then I had a run in with the pistol and I'm sorry if you guys have heard these stories or I'm repeating myself but I um I, w- I was bear hunting and I spotted this blonde boar down in this meadow and I uh, had an evening thermal that was coming downhill. And just so you know, like I love hunting bears in the evening. Like in the mountains, when those mountains get shaded, the air starts to cool. It starts to drop out of these canyons. And then you have like this consistent downhill wind for the last hour of light. This is like prime time to go stalk bears. And so I had this on this bear. It was a blonde. I had to, you know, of course it's this monumental go where I've got to lose 2,000 feet of elevation and, you know, gain 1,000 up the other side or maybe 750 up the other side. And I start gaining and I'm going up and he's in this, just this neon green like spring in there. And I don't see him, don't see him, don't see him come over the little rise and there he is. And I'm able to duck back down. I'm, I get like 30 yards from this bear. And this bear is kind of feeding, facing me. He doesn't know I'm there. He's just feeding and so I'm just waiting for a good angle. I had to wait quite a while for a good angle. And finally, he gave me a good angle of this good broadside shot. Drew back, settled my pin 30 yards, the zipped him. Uh, arrow passed through him, perfect lung shot. And uh, this bear spun and bit at that arrow. It roared and, like, and then started running full speed at my location. And my location, like I say, he's not trying to charge me. He's just trying to escape. And he's trying to escape downhill because he's hurt. But the way the country is, it like filters him down this draw exactly where I'm standing. And so he starts coming for my position. And so pretty soon I have to protect my position. And so I set my bow down, uh, set my bow on the ground, get both hands on my pistol. And as he starts to run towards me, I start firing on him. And um, it was not my best showing. I have these shooting processes for keeping cool during the moment with my bow and arrow and delivering perfect arrows. It's what I've practiced my whole life. But you throw me in a high-stress situation with my pistol that I've just rolled a couple pop cans down the road, like, look out. I am in a dangerous situation. And so uh, I pulled up that pistol, and I run a Glock 10 millimeter. It carries 15 rounds. It is super accurate. I didn't look at my sights for the first seven shots. Like, I was just squeezing lead and squeezing shots, and there was dirt flying around, and he was not that far away. In the end, I, like, shot, I think I shot nine times. I can't remember if it's nine or 11. Like, I kind of miscount the story, or I can't remember exactly, but I think it was nine times I shot. And I hit that bear twice and grazed him once. So, like... I didn't get attacked. I defended my position like it all worked out, but it proved to me that, hey, man, you need to build a shooting process. You need to do more intentional practice with your pistol like you're not as dangerous as you thought you were. You missed that thing a bunch of times. Thank goodness I had an arrow through his lungs and then able to put some shells in him and drop him. But, yeah, I mean, ended up killing him, you know, 10 feet away from me. So um, since then, I've talked to like special forces guys. I've talked to um uh, like uh, Roger Holster that I've had on the podcast. He helped me build a shooting process. Mike Glover, like some of these guys I really respect. Um, uh, also Joel Turner, who uh, does great instruction on uh, archery, also does instruction on pistol. Like I've talked to these guys and been able to build this process. And my process is to draw, find my sights, squeeze rounds, you know. And so... Uh, what I do is I run these drills or this practice where I have my gun all unloaded, double check, and then I'm drawing and I'm putting the aim on different targets, whether it's an archery target, whether it's something in my garage, and then I'm squeezing around. So draw, squeeze, draw, squeeze. And so I'm just practicing finding my sights, acquiring my target, squeezing off shots so I can be in the woods with confidence with this 10, you know, just in case I run into a grizzly bear, charging black bear, or something of that nature, like I'm ready for it. So I'm way better prepared now than I was and I've got the idea in my head of what I need to do. But, you know, it just goes like this is dangerous game. And you have to be at the top of your craft. And uh, and you also have to be prepared for when situations go bad. But it's part of the thing that makes it so fun. 
Like, if there was no risk in life, like, sure, I can go through life with no risk and just sit on my couch and TV and never drive down to the store, never do anything. It's not a very fulfilling, meaningful life. Uh, but when you have these consequences and this real danger and you're prepared to handle this real da- danger, you know, these are, this is a, a real time, like, thrill or adrenaline rush or w- whatever you call it. But I absolutely love it, man. It's, um, it's incredible to get a chance to stalk these bears. So, uh, wind is, um, number one when you're stalking them. They don't have the greatest eyesight in the world. So they are nearsighted. Uh, they will still catch movement but they just don't see as well as a deer and elk. So I've been able to stalk these things in the wide open. Like I'll catch them in the sagebrush opening or uh, meadow grass, and like I'll just move when they have their head down, and then I'll freeze when they pick their head out. And sure, you don't want to be some huge dark figure in the middle of meadow, and they can see you and catch you. Like I've had a big one catch my buddy Dan and I, just this giant bear as big as a Volkswagen bus. And at first, when he first came out, we were in the middle of the open park, and we were moving in tune, but we had a rise in between us and him, and we were able to get into 50 yards, and then he ended up walking down the timber ridge or over that rise, and then we were just stuck in the middle of the meadow, two humanoids trying to crouch down, and he kind of picked us up and knew something was wrong, but I've had other times where I've moved a mile with a bear in the wide open, just moving when they have their head down and freezing when they have their head up, and I just blend into the sage, and so... Uh, they don't catch, they will catch movement, but they don't have as good an eyesight to pick you up. So you can get away with a lot more. And some of my most thrilling stocks are like moving with these bears in these parks. Um, they, they will spook from noises. Like there's, you know, at least where I hunt, there's grizzly bears or there's bigger bears or they know human danger. And so I had a giant chocolate and this was like, I talk about monumental goes for a bear. So this is a spot I have. And now I have a little raft that I carry with me. And so, it, I mean, it's pretty much lose a couple thousand feet, cross the river in a raft where there is white water in this river if you go too far. And then um, climb up the other side, try to kill the bear. And then you have to do it all back over again to get home. So they're like, but there's a bunch of bears in these in this canyon. And so I'll look at these bears, and there was this giant chocolate, and I decided to go for it. And this was back in the day where I didn't have the raft system figured out. My system was an inner tube, and my waders, and my rain jacket zipped over the top, and then try to paddle across to an inner tube. <laughs> Such an idiot. <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't died over the years. I have gotten safer as I get older. Like, I still like to go all in on these adventures. I've just got better wood sense, better decision making. But, I mean, you know, I was confident in my skills, but I would just be exhausted after doggy paddling across that river on that inner tube. It just took so much effort to get across the river. So it was not the best system, but, you know, I, I didn't die. I got across there, but... um I saw this giant chocolate, so I had a buddy or two that were glassing, and it was my turn for the stock, and I decided to cross the river in my inner tube and um, get up there and climb up there all the way up for this giant pudgy chocolate bear, and I'd, I'm a sucker for big chocolates. I love the color face, and it's part of the beauty of hunting these black bears. As you can see, in blonde, jet black, chocolate, cinnamon, like there's all these different colors, which are really cool, and, and big bears get me going no matter which color they are. Like I love a big boar with a big pumpkin head. It's just such a trophy to me. So anyways, it's one of those big chocolate, big pumpkin head on him, and I got to climb all the way up the other side, and I come in to where he was at, and he's right there, man. He's like right in bow range, right where he should be. And I, I got this limb in between me, and he's feeding, and it's like, okay, he's broadside. If I take one more step to my left or two steps to my left, I'll get this huge fur limb out of my way, and I'll have a clear shot at him. So I literally had to take two steps, and I'm keeping my eye on the bear. When his head's down is when I'm trying to move, and I'm trying to get this open shot. And I stepped on a stick in one of my two steps, like just not looking at my feet, looking at the bear. And I cracked a stick, and that bear's head shot up. And then he just did the classic slow turn and roll, and then go. And he was gone, and I didn't get the shot. I was so close to killing that bear. And we're talking, you know, a three-hour stock by the time I went all the way down, cross the river, up the other side. And I've got three hours to go to get back out of there or more. And I've got to cross back across the river. In fact, I think I ended up hiking at the bottom of the canyon. It was more miles, but I didn't have to cross back around the river and then could have my buddies pick me up. But my point is, 
is that they will spook if they hear a sound or a stick crack. And that was, um, you know, that, that was the downfall of that stock across that river over there. So, um, got to be cognizant of your noise. You can get away with a little bit more movement and the wind has to be right. If the wind isn't right, just wait to play, wait for another day, wait for a better time of day. Like just be patient with these things. Cause if you bust them by wind, you're never going to see them again. So you got to have the wind right. And then, um, judging bears is extremely difficult. So I talked about, you know, these giant boars with pumpkin heads, like, man, that's what I love to chase. It's such a trophy. But you have to identify that. There's like a lot of smaller bears out there. Like, I mean, sometimes I have to look at 10 smaller bears before I find one shooter boar. And I've killed enough bears now. Like, usually my, like, like black bears aren't as big as you picture them. Like, you picture bears or sometimes you see these full life mounts. And those are like the specimen of the bear species. But there's also like genetics involved. Like, I killed old bears that are 200 pounds and five and a half foot. Like, they just don't build them all seven-foot bears. And out west here, you know, the bears, like an adult bear, will range anywhere from, you know, four foot or four and a half foot to seven foot would be an absolute giant. I consider, after they get over six foot, I consider them a giant out west. They're over six foot. They have, like, over a 19-inch skull, like, usually 19 and change, maybe high 18s, maybe 20. Like, we have really good big pumpkin heads on our boars. So, over a 6-foot boar is a really good boar for me. Like, that's what I, that's a trophy size boar. For years, uh, uh, my line was 5.5-footer. Uh, and, and I've killed a bunch of great 5.5-foot boars with nice pumpkin 18-inch skulls that I'm really happy with. And so, tough to turn down those bears out west. And when I talk about 5.5 foot or six foot basically that's the square measurement so that's the measurement from the tip of the nose to the tail or from front paw to front paw and that's after you kill them and lay out the hide and don't stretch it out or anything and then you can kind of measure that bear and see what he is and um it's also like you know you can kill a six foot bear that's way bigger than a six and a half foot bear he's just got more girth like they build them short and fat long you know they build them all different types So it's like difficult because you got to be able to identify what a big bear is, but they have different body types. No two are alike. You might find one great big pudgy six foot two bear that's really fat and filled out, or you might find one that's six foot seven and a little bit more uh, lanky. Um, So it's like being able, like just looking at a bunch of bears really helps. But, you know, the first thing is to determine whether or not it's a boar or sow. And uh, the best way is to see cubs, of course. Like, uh, so give it time, you know, watch those things. Even if I'm trying to make a move on that bear, I'm going to sit there for 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, I'm good at identifying the sex of the bear. In fact, I've never killed a sow. All of my bears have been boars. But uh, that being said, I have definitely made mistakes. Uh, I have looked at bears thinking they're a sow uh, or thinking they're a boar and thinking about how I'm going to make a play and a, and a cub comes out. And you can see some giant sor- uh, sows that have giant bodies that look like boars. So, you know, I've definitely been fooled. I'm not 100%. I know the ones that I've killed have all been boars, but a lot of, you know, some of that is identifying. And then, um, you know, you know, some is... Some is luck too that I that I haven't killed a sow, but that is the goal is to kill mature boars. And the boars, you start to get a feel for what they look like. So the boars are going to have a bigger chest, bigger front end, uh, bigger front legs. They're going to be as big in the front end as they are in the back end. Sows are going to have a really big butt and be smaller in the chest, and and that goes for sows or also young boars too. Will look that way, but a big butt, smaller front end, smaller chest. The heads, like if you were to draw a line in between the ears and then from both ears down to the nose, a sow or a young boar is going to have a long skinny head, almost look like a dog head. Like it's uh, long and skinny, where a boar's head is going to be the same distance between the ears as it is down to the nose. It forms like a right triangle, and it's going to look like a like a big round head and then a stovepipe of a nose on them. Um, also like the ears are a dead giveaway. Like the ears are the same size, whether it's a big bear or a small bear. So a small bear is going to have Dumbo size ears on the top of his head. His ears are going to look really big. Uh, his face is going to look long and skinny. It's not going to look fat and filled out like a pumpkin. 
big boars going to have a pumpkin shaped head they're going to have that right triangle in between the ears so as wide as they are long uh, and those ears are going to be small and on the side of their head if you can see a crease or a cleft in the middle that's usually a really good boar really good bear so those are some of the things that I look for and it's you know it's just looking over a bunch of bears and trusting your instinct on them and you have to make calls and the mediums can be the toughest ones and it's tough to call yourself off a bear once you finally shoot one and you know I think everybody has to work up to a trophy sized bear too I mean it's all what you're into but there's no shame in killing a five foot bear or a five and a half foot bear like that is an average size for a bear to really get a six foot plus bear that's a specimen it's like you know trying to shoot a 180 inch muley or 170 inch muley like they're big they don't come all the time and so they're really special when you kill a big bear uh, but you have to learn how to identify a big bear and then also you have to work your way up um, you know you have to kill a few bears to know what a big one is and there's um those big bears they also just have such a swagger and walk about them like you can just almost tell from their walk that they're just king of the mountain and they just kind of swagger and kind of strut and like a, they just like almost labored in their walk so you can really tell a big bear from his attitude and behavior as well like that's another thing to key into and then you know being able to close in on these things you know, I'm fairly aggressive. Um, once I see him, you know, I know that I can get away with more movement. So I'm definitely not going to move when his head's up. I definitely have to be quiet, but just trying to get myself into range uh, and keep that element of surprise. It's like stalking any animal. Keep my eye on them, read their mannerisms, and start closing in. And then I like to get closer shots on bears. You know, I don't want to be tracking a wounded bear, so I want to make sure 100% I can put a perfect arrow in them. I end up killing a lot of my bears in that 40 to 50 range, you know, in the 40 yards to the 50 yard range, and then, you know, I've killed some closer and killed some farther as well, further as well. But um, I really like them in that range. I like to shoot big expandables on them. Bears are not tough to get a pass through. You think of a bear as like this big, tough animal, but really they're no tougher to get a pass through than like a whitetail. And so I like using as big a cut as I can. The bears also have um, a bunch of hair on them. Uh, that hair will soak up blood, not leave as good a blood trail. And so I like shooting them with a big expandable. Um, I like the... Um, uh, the, the Evolution has a, a hybrid expandable that works really well on those bears. It's perfectly suited for them. Uh, also like the, the Grim Reaper Inch and 3 8 that's a great cut as well. Any of those ones will open them up and leave a big hole on a good blood trail. Uh, bears take a precision shot. Um, bears are tough animals. And um, their, their vitals are actually a third the size of a whitetail. So their lungs and heart and liver, when you measure it versus a whitetail, they're a third the size. So it takes a precise shot. You don't want to be too forward on those bears, I've learned. Um, you, d you don't. You want to be back off the shoulder three, four inches. I mean, they say shoot bears middle, middle. And that's, you know, middle front and back and middle up and down and, you know, I'm not quite there. I like them a little bit forward a middle for sure, like to catch that liver and lungs, but I definitely don't like to be tucked way tight to that shoulder. I like to be back just a little bit and then middle of the body. I don't like to, like with any animal, middle of the body as far as height is really important and don't like to be low, don't like to be high on them. Uh, it's always been my dream to shoot a bear standing up looking at me, and I've been really close. Usually when they stand up, they know you're there. They, like, stand up to look at you to get, like, a better look, and it's, like, this this really tight window where you can't really draw on them because they're stood up looking at you, and the minute you go to move, they'll spook. And so I, excuse me, I end up waiting in those scenarios a lot, like waiting for a good angle. Uh, waiting for a good angle on those bears put that arrow in there of course um quartering is always good angles are always good in archery and um and then always um be cautious as you're trailing bears as um you know you'd hate to get ambushed or have them attack get too close so uh always be on your game tracking that thing out up have your pistol out be ready to go and i've ran into dangerous situations like couple boars that I've shot off sows that were chasing sows those sows hung around including that big cinnamon like 
I knew I put a good arrow in him. I found the arrow just caked in blood. And as I started approaching down where he was at down there, I could hear uh, jaws popping and hear rustling in the brush. I'm like, man, is he still alive in there? And I'm by myself with my pistol. It's getting dark at this point. Uh, it's almost dark at this point. You know, gave him a little bit to expire, but it was that sow in there. She was staying around him, still popping her teeth and had to kind of chase her off and then able to find that bear who's expired down in there, dead as a doornail. And um, same thing with another jet black boar I shot. And uh, it's like this chocolate cinnamon or this uh, chocolate sow just kept hanging around after I shot that boar. Like I couldn't get photos or anything like uh, shot him and he uh, he died like right in sight or something. And then that sow just kept hanging around. It was getting dark. And um, I think I gutted him, you know, finally able to chase her away and gutted him real quick and then left him and came back in the morning and got him. But, yeah, be careful if those sows are still on them. And you can run into other bears while you're packing a bear, while you have a bear. So you just always have to be cognizant of that. Um, oh, nice. My um, wife just sent me a text. She knows I'm recording. She's going to grab me a bacon cheeseburger for lunch. Whew. That'll be good. From one of our favorite spots here in Annas, the gravel bar. So, um, but spring black bears, man, it's gonna it's gonna be killer. And again, um, you know, this life, we don't get to, you know, we hedge our bets to to live live as long a life as we can. But it's really about enjoying life day to day. It's so tough not to put this carrot in front of our nose. Like once I build this house, I'll be happy. Or once I kill this big buck, I'll be happier. Like, and not that we make those deals with ourselves, but we almost have this internal dialogue that tells us this, that, you know, once I get in this position on this job and I'm making more money and I have more free time, I'll be happy. And, you know, some of that is true, right? It's like getting ourselves to a better position to enjoy life more, getting ourselves to a better financial position, uh, getting ourselves to have more free time. Like those are all long-term goals that we're working towards for sure. But you have to enjoy the journey and enjoy it along the way. And, you know, I can tell you, you know, I've harvested a bunch of trophies with my bow and arrow, which is incredible. It's like climbing Everest for me. They've taken so much hard work and dedication and really improving at my craft. But I can tell you it doesn't make the man. It's like the the real fun in it is I look back with a lifetime of these bow hunting adventures and hopefully, you know, I have a bunch more in front of me. But as I look back at these adventures, like some of my unsuccessful hunts are my best ones. And really, it's the journey along the way. It's like going on these big adventures, like living life to the fullest, spending time with family and friends and 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 like it's it's true enjoyment to do what we love to do with our friends and be laughing or like with our family or whatever the case is uh but it's like really enjoying something fun and then just immersing myself in in nature like there's something in our dna that is tied directly to these mountains to the prairies to the foothills that we live in and it, you just feel alive when you're interacting with this habitat and nature and being able to spend time both with friends and family but also by myself I learned so much about myself and then it just does so much for living in the present moment of only thinking uh, how I'm going to kill this buck or only thinking uh, how I'm going to move through these woods and where I'm going to camp at where I'm going to get my water gosh it's like you know, we're the lucky ones that have found our passion of what we truly love to do. And so now the goal is to try to do as much of it as we can. And, and through that, it enriches our own lives. And in turn, we enrich the people's lives around us. You know, our family, uh, uh, my dad, my daughters, my, you know, um, my wife, like, like all these people, because I'm happy and chase my passion and live this fulfilling life, I'm able to help fulfill theirs and um, go do trips with them and go do adventures with them. But it's it's really what this life is all about is the journey. And, and um, you know, sure, the goal for me was to kill a 320 bull every year or to arrow a 200-inch buck. And um, it is. It's absolutely amazing when it comes together, when all the hard work pays off and you've honed your craft and you've put 25 years of your life into it and you arrow your absolute dream buck. It means the world to me. But I tell you, the true enjoyment is the journey and preparing and improving in this and being present in those moments. So just do um, do as much as you can in this life. It doesn't last forever and it's fairly short and there's no guarantees. And so that's like make the most of your life 
you know, whether it's doing these adventures, whether it's enjoying every day, living in the present moment, making the, the, the most out of your career to make enough money to get this freedom, you know, whatever it is, we all have these different life goals. And I know I'm just trying to live out mine to the, to the absolute fullest. And it makes for a real rewarding, happy life and also enjoy it along the way. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm ranting, but it's so toughy, tough in this life. Like it's for everybody, and it's. I think it's tough to be happy as well. And I don't know how anybody else is wired, but you know, there's like real depression that runs in my family. And then in today's day and age, with these phones and social media and things, like um, it's tough. Like I know working all those hours, like finishing this house towards the end, I get depressed. Like there's just no balance to my life, and I'm working too much. And even though I enjoy construction, I'm doing this meaningful project. All of a sudden, like I can't gain the perspective, and I start slipping down that path. And I did down the last house I did too. Um, so I know when I work too much or I get out of balance, like I know myself, and I'm prone to depression. It runs in my family, and. So it's like something I have to watch out for. But I don't think like being happy in this life is a given. I think it's really difficult and something we have to work towards and work for. And um, we're just trying to make the the most meaningful life. And we, you know, we get one chance in the skin we have. And it's like this amazing gift. And we just have to make the most of it. And, you know, we don't get to be hunting every day or being on these epic trips every day. So you better have, you better enjoy yourself in between or training for these hunts and you better enjoy the time with your family and try to enrich their lives and really try to truly be happy and not let the stress and anxiety get to you too much. Like just try to keep this perspective. And and for me too, it's being able to look myself in the mirror. It's being able to do what I say I'm going to do, be responsible, be a hard worker, get work done, be productive. Like there's all these characteristics that, you know, help make me a happy person. And, you know, for me, it's, um, you know, I don't sit around or I don't relax much, you know, even though I like to relax an hour or two in the evening, whether that's cooking dinner, having dinner with the family, or we sit down and watch a show together. Sure, I enjoy that time, but I can't sit around all day. Like, I've got to be productive and feel good about myself and be able to look myself in the mirror with the um, actions I take and the life that I live and be able to be happy with myself. But, you know, I think it's something we truly have to work on. And I think, you know, I'm continuing uh, working to be, you know, as happy as I can in, in this lifetime. And for me, it's like chasing these adventures uh, truly fulfills me. And so, like, I put a lot of time and effort into these and training for them. And, and through that, I've fallen in love with the process where I'm happy day to day. But... All right, I'm getting a little deep for the end of the podcast. Let's wrap this thing up. Got you guys some spring bear action. Um, super stoked for this trip I'm going to take and just going to continue to try to bring you guys the absolute best podcasts I can, man. Like have these in-depth conversations and try to help enrich your guys' life and make it better and encourage you to chase your passions and um, uh, to chase adventure and then also to be the best family guy that you can be, which is... Um, equally or more so important you know to to make sure we give our kids a good chance to enjoy life and uh, make sure we enrich their lives so um man it's super fun it's like um getting on here for a therapy session with you guys uh it's uh i'm really able to voice out what's um going on in my head and um thoughts that i have and things so uh, I just really appreciate all your guys' support. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. That really helps me out. And then also to leave reviews on the the podcast platform you listen to. It really helps the algorithm and helps push the podcast. As, um, you know, we're um, trying to put out, I'm trying to put out the absolute best podcast I can. And so got great guests coming up. I'm going to sit down and do more of these solo podcasts, like try to do one a month. I don't want you guys to get too tired of me, but I also want to get my input in and um, things that I'm working on. And it's just like current bow hunting lifestyle, you know, and so want to continue to talk about that and get some other good things in the work. So I just um, I really appreciate you guys listening in. It truly means the world. Like I didn't start off this podcast with the idea of being successful or um, you know, it's just been amazing what it's been able to grow into just because of you guys and this audience that listens in each and every week. And I truly love doing it. Um, so I just want to continue to bring you guys these good conversations and, um, and good pertinent information that'll help make you better successful and enrich your lives. So man, that's the goal. So, all right, guys, with that, um, 
I'm in Australia having a great time right now, I'm sure. And uh, I'll release some pictures on social media. And with that, we'll figure out which podcast is next week and get it all loaded up and released to you guys. So um, check in with you soon.